But in the 1980s, things begin to change again. The picture that I have behind you here is also of uh, the Pittston strike in 1989. There were, uh, uh, because of certain changes in the law in the Reagan administration, uh, it allowed for uh, coal companies to do away with unions and not have to hire union miners and be able to dismiss miners that are, that are becoming union. Uh, the biggest company that was responsible for this was Massey Energy. Massey Energy uh, came into the region. They would buy up a coal mine, shut it down, fire everybody, and then open up another coal mine 100 yards away uh, which is essentially the same coal mine, but they're opening up a new one, and then hire workers, but they would only hire non-union workers. This led to a very large series of strikes. There was also a lot of union corruption at the time, and the union was kind of collapsing under its own weight. Uh, there were several various union tactics that they tried, but there were a lot of very violent strikes uh, that took place in the 60s and 70s. Oh, excuse me, in the 70s and 80s, and then a couple in the 90s. Uh, but the union began to lose its hold, and the union as it exists today in the Appalachian coal fields is virtually non-existent. I mean, they're there, but uh, less than 15 percent of the miners uh, in West Virginia are now unionized. It is a thoroughly non-union area now, and it has been. Uh, and coal companies have reiterated their power and their control over the region. Partly because of this, uh, and also union numbers have diminished because the, mi the number of coal miners themselves has diminished uh, in, the, in the last couple of decades. In fact, in the last 20 years, uh, over 30,000 coal mining jobs have been lost in central Appalachia. This is because of a new method of mining called mountaintop removal. Mountaintop removal is a method of mining, which we'll, again, talk about a little bit more in a second. But it's, it, it's the type of mining that blows the tops off mountains and they take everything as, aside from the coal and push it into the valleys and the streams beside that. And it's highly mechanized. You only need about half the number of miners to do a mountaintop removal job than an underground mining job. And therefore, fewer miners. And fewer miners also means fewer union members, which decreases the power of the union. And uh, they have this enormous equipment that they do with, that they use with this. They have what's called a drag line, a crane kind of uh, apparatus that's 20 stories high and can pick up uh, over a ton, tons uh, of rock uh, at a time. But the union's power diminished. And as the union's power diminished, the activism in Appalachia shifted a little bit. That's Blair Mountain today as it stands. This is what the coal companies want to do to it. It's really impossible to describe the scale unless you actually see it in person or unless you fly over it. But the scale of this is enormous. In central Appalachia, that includes West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee, they have destroyed enough property to equal the size of the state of Delaware. Uh, so it's a very highly destructive form of practice. And there, 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 there are environmental reasons, of course, to oppose mountaintop removal, aside from the fact that it, it poisons water. And cancer rates in towns around mountaintop removal sites double. Uh, you also have huge concentrations of brain tumors you have uh, higher rates of birth defects, and you have increased levels of flooding. Obviously, if you strip away the trees and the topsoil, uh, and you have this rugged terrain, uh, there are floods everywhere. The campus where I teach was flooded out, in fact, just two weeks ago. Um, those are, there are environmental reasons. There are cultural reasons for opposing mountaintop removal because it's destroying mountain culture as it exists. Uh, in a lot of different ways, by taking away a lot of flora and fauna uh, of the region, things like ginseng that grow naturally uh, in, in these mountains and that are really abundant and are completely being wiped out. What's really being wiped out are the streams. Thousands of miles of streams have been destroyed. And the streams that come out of the Appalachian Mountains feed the river systems of the eastern United States. And this is extremely uh, significant. 
The river systems of the United States come, of uh, the eastern part of the United States, comes from these mountains. And water, as the world's population goes from 7 billion by mid-century to 10 billion, water is going to be more valuable than coal in 50 years. But here in the eastern United States, our water supply is being destroyed systematically. And it's happening at a very rapid pace. Uh, this, here's an example of what it does to the water uh, in the local area. I am not a hydrologist, but I'm under the assumption that that's not good, uh, that you can smell the sulfur coming out of it and uh, lots of other bad smells too. But it goes in, it finds its way into the drinking water, and it really can, you cannot drink water that comes out of a tap in southern West Virginia, you can't do it. Uh, the, the water supplies are, are incredibly damaged, and that's just one example of them. This has led to a huge activist movement. The picture that you see behind you is uh, in Washington, D.C. in October of 2010. This was called the Appalachia is Rising event. About 3,000 activists from Appalachia and from other places, but largely from Appalachia, came to D.C. to hold a major protest. And it's a huge eclectic mix uh, of people. Uh, some of them are hardcore environmentalists. Some of them are college students who are activists. Some of them um, are retired union miners. A lot of them are locals uh, who live under mountaintop removal sites and who have to put up with the blasting have to put up with the, uh, their water being contaminated, not to mention the unbelievable amounts of dust that go up into the air. And so a lot of locals are fighting against this. But the coal industry has the, uh, it, it's a one industry region. And the coal industry says we provide electricity for the United States and we create jobs. And that is the way in which they continue to do what they're doing. And in this region of the country, if you say, I'm against a certain type of coal mining, you're immediately labeled as a tree hugger who wants to kill jobs. And so it is a very difficult process for the people that are standing up. But something else begins to happen with this movement. People start picking up red bandanas and are wearing them around their necks again. The uh, guy you see right there is Larry Gibson. Larry Gibson uh, is a guy that lived in a place called Cayford Mountain, which was near Paint Creek and Cabin Creek. And uh, he became an activist. He was not an activist of any kind, but he became an activist when uh, a mountaintop removal job blew up half of his family cemetery. And uh, then he began his activism. He's actually suffered quite a lot for this cause uh, because uh, he's had threats on his life. He's had his house shot up. He's had uh, somebody uh, hanged his dog, um, a number of things like that. If you make a stand against the coal companies, uh, there's a price to be paid uh, for it. And, uh, but the red bandana is once again, though, becoming this uh, symbol uh, of challenging the coal industry's uh, autonomy in this region. This is a picture from the march on Blair Mountain, which happened last summer. As you can see, there was, there's a few of us. I'm in there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> I don't know exactly where. But anyway, the, uh, what we decided to do, uh, and I'm with a group, uh, have been with a group called the Friends of Blair Mountain, and uh, that's to counter the, the coal industry has a slogan in West Virginia called Friends of Coal. Everywhere you look, it's friends of coal, billboards, friends of coal, friends of coal, friends of coal. Uh, Marshall University and West Virginia University play once a year in a football game. It's called the Friends of Coal Bowl. Uh, and recently, the coal companies have lobbied to get a big chunk of coal put uh, outside the locker room at, the, for, at West Virginia University so the, the, peop the, 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 uh, will, the players will walk by and rub the coal for good luck. Uh, before they before they go out, it's a very again it's a very powerful lobby. But anyway, uh, the organization I'm with and a few other organizations banded together to reenact the original march on Blair Mountain. March 50 miles, uh, and we marched 50 miles over the course of a week. Actually, we in five days, Monday through Friday, we marched 10 miles a day 
on Saturday we had a major rally at the foot of Blair Mountain. Had some people like Bobby Kennedy Jr. and and uh, some others who celebrities who showed up, the ones that were brave enough to show up, because a lot of people were afraid they'd get shot uh, with good cause, because uh, as we went along the march, there were some people who applauded us and then some people who reviled us pretty heavily. Because, uh, again, we're, you're in a region where the entire media system, the educational system, the political system, everything is controlled. And so people believe that, uh, a lot of people believe that this march was about killing jobs and winning this public relations conflict uh, can be an uphill climb. But not everybody uh, was opposed to us. We had people such as this uh, who came out uh, and, you know, with thank you notes. We had um, on Thursday of the march, uh, we were trying to figure out where we were going to stop for lunch. We were having a lot of logistical problems because originally we were going to stop at campsites along the way. Our campsites were shut down from us uh, two days before the march began. Uh, all our campsites called us and says, no, you can't stay anymore. We found backup campsites. They dropped us. Uh, one person whom I know who owned a campsite told me she had three family members who worked for the coal industry. The coal company called her up and said, if you let them stay, your family members lose their job the next day. So it's that kind of an atmosphere. And, um, but not, but there were, uh, on Thursday, we were trying to figure out where we were going to stop and have lunch, and a lady volunteered for us to stay, stop in her backyard. So we all went and stayed in her backyard, and I was able to talk with her and, and found out that this lady's grandmother had lived in the same house uh, when the first march was going through in 1921. And the miners stopped and ate lunch in that backyard in 1921. And so she wanted to live up to that heritage. So there were a lot of little things like that that happened along the way. And uh, in some cases, we would go by homes and people would walk out and everybody would be wearing red bandanas and would be applauding us. And then right across the street, people would be cussing at us with everything that they had and throwing things and being rather ugly. <laughs> so. That's on the last day as we uh, marched up. That's Mickey McCoy from Kentucky who came. Uh, and as you can see again, the red bandanas and how that plays prominently. This movement and the mountaintop removal talk can sometimes threaten to overshadow this very valuable history that we're trying to save because it's all tied together. The 1921 march uh, was about challenging a, a system of control. The 2012 March uh, was about, or the 2011 March, excuse me, was about the same thing. And it was about a, a challenge to a system of control over a region. And it's why Blair Mountain has, is such a calling card. Here are some bullets that were found from, the, from Blair Mountain. Uh, up there on the left is Kenny King. He's a local amateur archaeologist. It's been uh, kind of hiking up around Blair Mountain for years, finding old bullets, finding old guns, finding all kinds of things from the battle. Beside of him is Har Dr. Harvard Ayers. Uh, both of them are good friends of mine. Uh, Dr. Ayers is a professor emeritus of archaeology at Appalachian State University in North Carolina. And they conducted the first archaeological uh, work on Blair Mountain and began to be able to reconstruct the battle from the archaeological evidence because a lot of it is very undisturbed. Uh, because nobody lives there. Uh, it's owned by the coal companies, uh, of course, and they uh, intend to blast it. A couple of years ago, we were able to get Blair Mountain put on the National Register of Historic Places, but a week after it was put on the National Register, the coal companies lobbied to get it taken off, and it was taken off the National Register. Now, there's a law that says there are other landowners uh, that encompass the battlefield. Obviously, the battlefield's really huge, and so there's a number of landowners, private landowners. There's a law that says if over half of the landowners object to something being on the National Register, then it can't be on the National Register. Well, the coal companies submitted a list, uh, a petition of letters, uh, and so it was one person over the halfway mark. So it got taken off. Well, we hired an attorney to look into uh, who these people were because we've been to the community of Blair. We know the people there. Uh, and the people there hate mountaintop removal, and they can't stand the coal companies. But um, 
so we had an attorney look into these letters. Uh, several of the people who wrote the letters were dead. Uh, one of them had been dead for over 30 years. Um, yeah. <laughs> It, it's it's kind of unbelievable, uh, but and then there are other uh, landowners who were once landowners in that area, but had since moved away and were no longer land, uh, landowners. Anyway, there are all kinds of discrepancies and forgeries and problems with this list. We took this list to the governor, and the governor refused to look at it. Uh, this governor is now a U.S. senator, uh, by the way, and so. Uh, uh, unable to, to do anything about it. And that's when we stepped up our activism. Here's, an, here's another uh, a few little, that's Kenny King's little personal collection of some of the things that he's found. Various bullets, guns, and even a few Native American uh, artifacts that he's found up on the mountain. There's actually, uh, on one side of the mountain, there's an old Shawnee burial ground there that's also there. Uh, at least we think it's Shawnee. We're not really sure, but uh, the coal companies now have no trespassing signs everywhere, and they have uh, their security going around the Blair Mountain all the time. So you can't, if you go to Blair Mountain today and get off the side of the road and start walking around, security trucks will be there within moments uh, to make you leave. So it's an interesting atmosphere. But in the community, in the community of Blair, which is on the north side of Blair Mountain. Uh, we were able to uh, get a little church. It was an old church that nobody was using anymore, and it uh, belonged to a lady named Winnie Fox. Well, Winnie Fox died about a year and a half ago, but she left it to her son, and she said that she would leave this little piece of land to her son on one condition, and that was the, the condition was that he would never sell his land to the coal companies. And so he's leased out the land to us, and we've taken the little church and turned it into a little Blair Community Center and Museum. We've taken these artifacts and we're taking those. We're beginning to build up as much as we can to try to create, a, you know, a little museum to tell this story and tell this history. We're also trying to do some other things in the community because you can't drink the water there. We're trying to get a reverse osmosis pump system put in uh, to be able to provide clean water uh, for people to drink and for people to cook with. And so we're trying to do a few other things like that in, in the community. But why don't get back to the word redneck? I want to go back to the essence of its meaning. In February, I was lucky enough to have dinner with Reverend Ron English. Now, most of you probably don't know who Reverend Ron English was, but he was a personal friend and protege of Dr. Martin Luther King. And uh, as it turns out, he lives in West Virginia now. He moved uh, after, after the 60s. He moved to West Virginia. He was taught by Dr. King. He was... Um, given his first suit by Dr. King. He actually said the prayer at Martin Luther King's funeral and was with him. He was with him when he gave the, I, you know, the I have a dream speech. Actually, uh, Ron told me that he'd actually given that speech about 20 times before. It was just the first time that speech was televised. Uh, but uh, so he, he was good at it by the time a, a camera uh, got there. But uh, I was talking with uh, Reverend English about the march itself and what happened in the word redneck because while the miners were marching and remember this is uh, a backwoods backward culture right and, uh, supposedly in 1921 there's a little t coal town on the way to Blair called Sharples and it was actually a place where we ran into some of the most contention during the march last summer but in the coal town of Sharples they actually had a company cafeteria which was unusual but they had one and the company cafeteria was divided into four sections. There was a section for whites, native whites. There was a section for immigrants, because there were a lot of immigrants working in the coal fields, a lot of Italians, Poles, Hungarians uh, that were working in the coal fields. And there was a section, uh, it was the immigrant section, the native white section, the black section, and then the company boss section of the cafeteria. When the miners came through and they saw this, they busted down all the doors, uh, came in with their guns and everything, uh, and then made the cooks f uh, feed all the marchers and feed everybody in the community there. But everybody was going to go into the company section and eat together. Uh, and they made it a point to where 
the blacks and the immigrants and the native whites were all in the same room, all eating together. This is 1921. This is a generation before Martin Luther King Jr. This is, this is 30 years before the American military is desegregated. This is at a time when the KKK was at the height of its power in American history in the 1920s. It had never been stronger. Uh, but yet, these supposedly backward people were far more progressive-minded than the rest of the country because what they were doing and what they saw was that the only way that you can have justice in America and the only way that you could have a better America is if people find ways to dissolve their differences and find a common cause and find a common ground. And that's what that red bandana meant to them. Unfortunately, and uh, Reverend English told me this, uh, as I was telling him this story, uh, he stopped me and he, he said, that's why Martin Luther King was killed. And that kind of took me aback. I didn't really know what to say about that, but he, he explained it further. He said one of the places that Dr. King wanted to take the civil rights movement was he said the biggest problem with civil rights in America and with economic injustice in America is that black people and poor white people are at odds with one another. And he says, you have to bring poor white people and black people together before there can be real change in America. And that's the direction that he wanted to, the movement to take. He wanted the civil rights movement and blacks in the South to reach out to poor whites. And uh, Ron English told me that, the, that he began to put that into his speeches. and He was starting to write letters about it. And of course, all of his stuff was monitored by the FBI. So it's his belief that his wanting to take that direction was what got him killed, uh, which is why he was uh, assassinated. This term redneck today has such a very, very different meaning. Uh, when I taught at WVU, I was getting my doctorate up there, uh, when I, I had you know, a number of uh, African-American students in class, not so many in the coal fields now because it's, it's, uh, it's much more homogenous in the coal fields now than what it used to be. But anyway, when I had African-American students and I was teaching West Virginia history to them, I would make them write down a description of a racist. So what is a racist? What does a racist look like? Where does a racist live? What does a racist drive? And of course, what, what would you get? You would get the stereotypical, every time, you would get the stereotypical description of a redneck. Pickup truck, rebel flag in the back, trailer park, ball cap, uh, you know, the whole nine yards, uh, shotguns, you know, this is their perception of a racist. When the original meaning of the word in 1921 meant bringing races together, because the miners lost the battle in 1921, the term has become uh, something that divides people. And that's because we don't know the history, and that's because we're not preserving the history. And that's what we need to change because we need to learn a heritage. The miners at Blair Mountain were unsuccessful in bringing about change. But it is by remembering that struggle that we can begin to take a step forward. We know that issues of race are still very relevant today in America with what's happened in Florida. We know that issues of unionism are very relevant in America. We know that issues of environmentalism are very relevant in America today. Economic injustice. And you can find all of that at Blair Mountain at this one place. Uh, that means all of these different things. And I think it's a microcosm for the United States and where we're going as a country and as a society today. The fate of Blair Mountain, of course, will be decided over the course uh, of the next year or two. Whether it remains as you see it, we would like it turned into a historic park and made into a tourist attraction, or whether it's destroyed and you see it, uh, you know, as kind of this desolate moonscape like I showed you before. The, that shows a lot about the, that will reveal a lot about the power structure, uh, what's going on, who controls the United States, and about the American people uh, ourselves. What do we care about? Do, do Americans uh, still look at the people of Appalachia as uh, people that are un, insignificant, marginalized? Will the stereotypes persist? Uh, or will we be able to break that and be able to find the, the history as it is? And I think it's in learning that history is the only way in which we can ensure our future, not just in Appalachia, but also in the United States, in uh, 
what will probably be a very turbulent 21st century. But thank you for your attention.